snow is falling down just a little bit The world's so quiet and still Santa's out there flying around And it's true That if you mean During E3 2013, Tom Clancy's The Division was officially announced. The unveiling showed a 7 minute gameplay clip. With the seemingly endless amount of depth, impressive gameplay and beautiful graphics, it was met with a huge amount of hype from the gaming community. The demo introduced the devastation that hit New York City following a viral outbreak that originated with the handling of money on one of retail's busiest days of the year, Black Friday. Tom Clancy's The Division was inspired by real world events. Operation Dark Winter, a bioterrorist attack simulation on the United States, and Directive 51, a presidential directive which claims power to execute procedures for continuity of federal government in the event of catastrophic emergency. Also showcased at E3 was a companion app that would allow players to join the game using a tablet. Using the app, players would be able to join a team as a drone that could offer tactical support to players on console and PC. After some delays, at E3 2015, the game's final release date and controversial PvEVP area, the Dark Zone, was revealed, but also confirmed was that the companion app had been scrapped. On the 18th of February 2016, the Division's open beta began for Xbox One, with PlayStation 4 and PC starting on the 19th. Over 6.4 million players participated in the beta. The Division was eventually released on the 8th of March 2016, two years after its initially planned release. The game broke company records, including the highest number of sales on the first day. The Division also broke the industry record for the biggest first week launch for a new game franchise, generating an estimated $330 million globally. Unfortunately, this wasn't completely represented in the reviews and customer response, which provided mixed emotions. Within days, there were comparison videos popping up online showing the difference between what was shown at E3 and the final product, where the graphics had obviously been tapered back. Initial feedback also talked about how the map looked considerably less vibrant, with long stretches of endless walking where very little happens, and that the lack of variety in activities made the game tedious in a large number of ways. The game was also plagued with bugs and connectivity issues, where players were either unable to keep a constant connection to the servers, or couldn't get on at all. These issues, plus a lack of in-game content, saw player numbers drop rapidly after release. In April 2016, Update 1.1 was released. Server issues for the most part had become more stable. The developers had also sought out to revive some of the in-game by introducing the first incursion to the game, Falcon Lost. Weekly and daily missions were also added to provide incentive for players to jump into the game on a more regular basis, and players could now trade gear with each other. Patch 1.1 also introduced the first gear sets into the game, giving players something new and more powerful to hunt for, but also adding considerably more build diversity into the game. Up until this point, the fastest and most efficient way of obtaining the best gear was through crafting, using the materials gained through missions and deconstructing unwanted gear and weapons. But the developers felt that this was taking away from the RPG element of the game, so 1.1 included quite a hefty increase in crafting material cost in order to have RNG play a larger part in finding those most sought after pieces. These updates were well received, but unfortunately they also introduced some new problems into the game. The game's most sought after gear was awarded to players on completion of the incursion, but naturally, with a game of this type, players quickly found ways to manipulate and abuse mechanics in order to gain advantage. The developers received criticism for how they handled this, with players saying it took too long to fix and that the abusers were not being punished. With the introduction of gear sets into the game, the game's build diversity should have become better than ever. Unfortunately, this was not the case. In fact, it was quite the opposite. The Sentry's Call set, paired with an SMG, proved to be so unbalanced versus the other gear available that there was no other option but to equip this build in order to stay competitive. I am inbound on your 
In May 2016, Update 1.2 was announced. Codenamed Conflict, it was better known at the time as the Cut the Rope update. This was due to an update that would now allow players to hijack other players' extractions, further adding to the high risk, high reward nature of the Dark Zone, but also opening up on the rift between PvE and PvP players roaming the area. A new incursion was released, Clear Sky, and four new gear sets. 1.2 also included a general loot drop increase across the board, making players feel like their time was being more adequately rewarded. In order to combat the stagnated build meta, the Sentry's Call 4-piece bonus will now only apply to semi-automatic weapons. But with this DPS heavy meta seeming put to rest, a new meta would rise. The Tank Meta. In what can only be assumed as a way to further combat the previous DPS meta, the Armored Damage Mitigation Cap was increased to 75%, hugely increasing the time to kill in PvP. This coupled with a high damage set like Tactician's Authority, running a capped BFB sticky bomb, and we have the Tactician build. Like the meta before it, this had no true counter. June 2016, the first expansion, Underground, and Update 1.3 was released. This was a PvE based update, where the major feature, Underground, supplied players with a mission type that would never be the same as the last time it was run. Also included was a new incursion, Dragon's Nest, and 5 new gear sets. And the existing weapon pool was increased with 9 new weapon types being added to the mix. One of the notable gameplay changes in this update was the considerable buff to the base damage of all shotguns. Up until this point they were relatively unused for the most part, but what the developers didn't see coming was that this new super weapon at close range, coupled with the newly adjusted Sentry's Call set, would create one of the most memorable metas that the game would see. In October 2016, the game in its current state was in a bit of trouble. With gameplay stagnating, the PvP scene only really being dominated by one or two build options, and each new patch adding more bugs than it seemed to be removing, the player base was starting to thin out. The developers saw this as a time for a full game overhaul. Update 1.4 was released and very little was left untouched. This update had changes made to weapons, gear sets, skills, talents, all with the intention of breaking the current metas and best in slots, and resetting the state of the game. World Tears were introduced to help new players with a cleaner way to progress towards the end game. A much debated topic, NPC Time to Kill was reduced in order to make the NPCs less bullet spongy. On top of this, a number of improvements were made to the AI. And an increase to all loot drops across the board had been put in place. Of course, the players still found a new meta within this update, but it wasn't to the same unmatchable caliber of previous metas. November 2016, Update 1.5 lands, including a new survival mode. This new mode was separate to the main game, stripping players of gear and forcing them to make their way to the middle of the map to be extracted before infection took them down. Named weapons had existed since launch, but 1.5 introduced a number of named gear pieces. These were unique and offered abilities not seen on other gear. A new set was added and 12 new weapon types. Further weapon balancing was included to try and reduce the growing meta from the last update but the Alpha Bridge build was still reigning strong. This patch was well received by the community, with most saying it was well overdue, and this was beginning to show with increased coverage on streaming platforms like Twitch. With the third and final paid DLC, an expansion to the PvP aspect of the game was introduced in February 2017. Last Stand was an addition to PvP that could previously only be experienced in the Dark Zone. This pitted players together in even teams fighting towards a common objective. On top of this, the Dark Zone was expanded to allow farming players more room to avoid those looking for PvP. And three of the existing missions had a new difficulty added to them. Legendary. Named gear and weapons were renamed to Exotic, 
but probably the biggest thing introduced by this update were the changes made towards interrupting the meta that had been around since patch 1.2. Armor and the way it works was being changed. The Alpha Bridge 4 piece bonus was updated so that it shares the free talent from your weapons instead of all three, effectively squashing the Alpha Bridge shotgun meta. Changes to the way that skill power works was also implemented, so that builds focused solely on skill power would now become a viable option. However, this gave birth to the 1.6 one-shot Seeker Mine meta. Six months pass after the 1.6 update, and over this time, players continue to move on to other titles due to the lack of endgame and the limited number of competitive build options available, and it was starting to show in the matchmaking results of activities like Survival and Last Stand. In August 2017, Update 1.7 offered some relief. The Seeker Mine meta was dealt a hefty nerf, which would render the PvP skill power damage build completely crippled, never to be seen as a viable PvP option again. Time limited events called global events that completely mix up the style of play offered in PvP were added, and with these came new vanity face masks that could be collected. The introduction of commendations and patches gave players that had invested hundreds and thousands of hours into the game something new to grind for, and something that would act as a badge of recognition for time spent. A new type of cash could be obtained through the premium vendor. These encrypted caches could be purchased using cipher keys that are collected during normal gameplay and commendation completion but could also be purchased using real-world currency. The encrypted caches contained a large number of vanity items and emotes to allow players to further customize their experience. So much like the commendations, players had something to show for the time spent in-game. And finally, the exotic Ninja Bike Messenger backpack had a complete rework. Previously, this exotic was considered trash tier, but the 1.7 update turned this into the most sought-after gear piece in the game. The 1.7 patch and the Ninja Bike bag opened up build diversity options to heights they'd never seen before. This new uncharted territory offered theory crafters a huge range of options, and brought gear back into the game that otherwise was considered as inefficient and worthless. For the first time, there didn't seem to be a meta that completely outclassed all other builds. But this wasn't long lived. 1.7 also introduced classified gear sets. This new gear offered even greater power to existing sets by allowing even greater bonuses via the 5th and 6th piece, although the true effect of classified gear on the game's build diversity wouldn't be noticed until much later on. Although it was 1.7 that fixed a lot of the game breaking issues, it wasn't until 1.8 was released that the gaming community started taking notice. 1.8 expanded on the successes of 1.7 by further introducing a large map expansion into the west side pairs. A new dedicated PvP activity was added, Skirmish, and a PvE Horde mode, Resistance. The Underground, released back in June 2016, received some much needed attention and more vanity items were added to the premium vendor. The rest of the classified sets were introduced alongside the new global events, and new exotic weapons were added to the loot pool. Further balances were applied across all areas. Player numbers were at levels rivaled only by the initial launch of the game. New players were joining the community and streamers and content creators were starting to return. Updates 1.7 and 1.8 had added long overdue changes to the game, and this was exactly what the community was after. At this point in time, the division was at an all-time high, but now that they had the attention of the gaming community, what would be their next move? I'm thrilled on behalf of the, the team at Massif and the teams that are working on the division uh, worldwide to uh, exclusively announce uh, to our community first that we're working on the sequel to the division, the division two. March, 2018, during a state of the game stream, it was announced that the division two was being worked on. The developers went further to say that there'd been a small team working on it since about a week after the division one was released. Due to recent events in the gaming community, there was a lot of discussion around whether the division should be focusing on continuing to expand or to release a sequel. So it's, it, it wasn't an easy decision, but there are so many stories and so many experiences that we want to uh, explore 
uh, within the world of the division that we really felt that a sequel was the best way to, to investigate these things. Incredible opportunity for us to take all that learning, all that experience from what the division is today and uh, put that into a new game. No further details on The Division 2 are to be released until E3 2018. The community developers went on to answer questions about the future of The Division 1 by stating two further updates will add new global events, new legendary missions, and a monthly feature called Shields, in which achievements earned playing The Division will grant special rewards in The Division 2. Over the two plus years that The Division has been active, it's had its ups and downs. The AAA title started off with a bang, but numerous bugs and imbalances caused a fall from grace that took almost two years to recover from. But problems aside, The Division has gained a loyal following that will continue the franchise into a second instalment with ease. The biggest question is, will they listen to this loyal community, or will they follow the industry trend of oversimplifying the game to appeal to the masses?